Good evening, Spy fans, and welcome once again. My thanks to the very kind people who support this channel on Patreon, people like Matthew Harkin and Thomas Ryan. I am talking about Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, both the big screen and small screen adaptation. Spy stories that make a very clear and deliberate attempt to be the antithesis of the kind of fantastical spy yarns that the James Bond series popularised. Of course, both versions of Tinker Tailor are based on the novel by John Le Carre, who was obviously an enormously famous author of spy stories, arguably better known than even Ian Fleming, and a part of Le Carre's appeal for readers is, well, much like Fleming, actually. The man had an in-depth knowledge of the espionage service because he actually served in it, and his work is lauded for being really down to earth. Both adaptations of Tinker Tailor certainly lean into this reputation to present a very unflashy story. These are no espionage tales where the hero inflates a gondola and parades through St. Mark's Square, though maybe that would have been an improvement for one of these versions. The toppest of top lines of the story for both versions of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy concern George Smiley, a man who single-handedly disproves the theory of nominative determinism, and a recent retiree of British intelligence called back into the fold to weed out a mole who has been apparently embedded for years in The Circus, as the intelligence outfit is nicknamed here. The rest of the story follows Smiley's investigations in nauseating detail as he susses out his former co-workers to figure out who the mole might be. I'm not going to be going into plot details much beyond that over the course of this review, but suffice it to say that this is a story that really makes you work for it. And I have to say, I appreciate that impulse in some ways. Nothing in Tinker Tailor is incomprehensible, but you just have to really, really pay attention. Remember names, faces, get to grips with some of the terminology. I recommend placing your phones in another room while you watch this, because even a cursory glance at a message for all of 10 seconds could leave you stumped for the next half an hour or so as to what the hell is going on. I like that it doesn't patronise its audience, but every now and then there were occasions where I felt a little lost, and much like Dr Christmas Jones in The World Is Not Enough, felt the need to ask... Do you want to put that in English for those of us who don't speak spy? I must say, when comparing the film and TV versions, I did have a much easier time following the big screen adaptation thanks to its stellar cast. It makes it a whole lot easier to remember who characters are when it's it's Colin Firth, it's Benedict Cumberbatch, John Hurt, Toby Jones, Kieran Hines, and so on, where the TV adaptation... Outside Alec Guinness as the lead, I only really recognised Ian Richardson from the original House of Cards, and, well, Patrick Stewart pops up for a, for a small role. So there were occasions when watching that version that I did have to go back and rewind a couple of scenes just to make sure I was fully understanding everything, because a lot of these blokes kind of look the same. For the purposes of this video, I was re-watching the movie version, but I hadn't seen it in nearly ten years. I saw it first when it, sort of around the time when it first came out, but I'd forgotten most of the plot details, which was really beneficial when it came to the 70s series. I watched the series before re-watching the movie for the purpose of this video, and I'm so glad that I could go into it kind of fresh in a way, not necessarily knowing where the story was going to go, because I had a really terrific time with the series. It, of course, stars Alec Guinness as George Smiley, and he's his usual unbelievably awesome self. Guinness is one of my all-time favourite actors. Uh, Bridge on the River Kwai and The Lady Killers are two of my all-time favourite films, and I've seen him in so much, from most of his David Lean roles to, well, to Star Wars, of course, and the man, as far as I'm concerned, never gave a bad performance in his life, and going one further than that, I think that his very presence in a film had the ability to elevate the status of whatever it was. He's that good. Like I say, he's the only one in the lead cast that I'm very familiar with. Ian Richardson I know, but everyone else I was being introduced to for the first time, or at least I hadn't recognised them from other British films and TV stuff that they'd done. I mean, everyone in this cast has quite the CV, a lot of UK dramas, and half of them have been in Doctor Who, but everyone across the board is cast so well, and this is far from being a vain and glamorous movie star cast. These are primarily character actors, actors with these kind of lived-in faces, and they're perfect for this vibe, which is obviously a gritty, kind of dramatised reality almost vibe. The cast of the 2011 film is also spectacular. Gary Oldman is in the smiley role, of course, but he's surrounded by phenomenal performers, and some of my favourite British actors, including in a terrific small part, Kathy Burke, who is primarily known as a comedic actor, but I think he or she turns out to be something of a standout role. Um, but then, like I say, acting across the board is faultless in this. When comparing the two smileys, though, I have to say that Guinness gives the more likeable performance, if there is such a thing as a likeable George Smiley performance. While Oldman is terrific, as I say, I ultimately find his smiley almost unbearably cold. Now, this is clearly the point. The character is very internalised, he's a very quiet man, a thinker, but Guinness's portrayal felt more real and, I guess, affable, and I feel like part of this comes from the men themselves. Oldman is 
one of the greatest working actors today, and he has such a diverse filmography, probably one of the most diverse filmographies in history, but when he plays cold and detached, he can just switch off that glint in his eye, and that's amazing, and it's clearly what he's been directed to do, but when you give us a cold and detached leading character, no matter how spot on that might be, it's still a cold and detached leading character, so there's only so far that I personally can appreciate that before I just become so detached that I kind of don't care. Guinness, on the other hand, feels more real to me as Smiley, and he's playing cold and detached too, of course. I mean, his Smiley is hardly a wisecracking everyman, but there is just something about him that is just that little bit more affable, so I'm just more inclined to like and care about the character and what he wants to achieve in this story. Again, you can argue, of course, that we're not supposed to like George Smiley, and mission accomplished for the 2011 version on that front, if that was indeed the intention, but it just does doesn't make Thor as engaging a character for me personally. When it comes to the supporting casts too, no one is giving a bad performance and the star-studded nature of the feature film certainly helps when it comes to keeping track of the names and characters, but these are movie stars and while they're hardly all made up to be matinee idols here, it gives the film a certain slickness that the cast of the TV series doesn't have and I think that that lack of slickness works better for these stories. I think that's an issue that I have with the feature film version in general, to be honest, that it looks too pretty. Obviously, this is a big feature film with an excellent cinematographer working on it who would go on to photograph Spectre, funnily enough, and the production values are great, but for a super down-to-earth story like I think this is trying to be, it just didn't match for me. Now, I haven't read the book, so it's highly possible that these locations that we see in the film are accurate translation of the texts, these but shipping containers where characters have confidential meetings and that are really cool looking and may well be based in fact. Uh, they probably are, but the whole thing looks so composed and well photographed and designed that I feel more detached from it than I think I need to be. It kind of doesn't feel like it's reality. Comparing to the series again, where I think it's perfectly designed and photographed in the sense that it doesn't feel overly designed or overly photographed. I feel the sweat and the stale cigarette smoke in these grotty little rooms. I feel like these men haven't showered or, or had a proper night's sleep in days, and that's great. It feels unglamorous and bureaucratic and underfunded, but that works for the vibe and the story, and it feels more real to me. Whereas in the film, you can tell that Benedict Cumberbatch's character has never had less than seven hours sleep in his life. The series also has much more room to expand on story elements, obviously being seven episodes of 45-ish minutes rather than just a two-hour feature. I think that the film does a really great job of condensing things down, but the series really has the space to breathe than take its time, and boy does it take its time. But despite being obviously this very unflashy spy story, the series wasn't afraid to lean into some of its thriller elements every now and then though, and there were plenty of scenes that I found to be genuinely exciting, thrilling, and suspenseful. The film version, on the other hand, felt like it had disdain for the very notion of trying to raise the audience's heart rates at all, and it treats one big reveal moment towards the end with such a plain matter-of-factness that it just really solidified for me that, oh, you don't really care if you're entertaining people, and that's admirable in a way and very brave. If you're coming to the 2011 Tinker Tailor, it's going to make you work for it. It's not going to hold your hand, and not that the series does hold your hand, but I found the big reveal moment in the series to be so much more exhilarating and tense, and you could tell that they've kind of built up to this moment, and they wanted the audience to be on the edge of their seat anticipating this, whereas I got the sense that the film version didn't really care. The film was incredibly well-reviewed when it came out and it won plenty of prestige awards, but personally I've just never really been able to connect with it. It ends up just feeling so cold and I'm so detached from it and yeah, I get that that may well be the intention, but if so, congratulations, you've made a cold film that I just can't invest myself in. Um, ultimately, I just didn't care about any of the characters or any of the stakes, so I was honestly just bored for the most part, as well produced and slick and well acted as it is. The series, on the other hand, engaged and gripped me so much more, primarily because I felt I could connect to the characters. It's a fine balance to manage when going for this whole kind of everyone's internal 
externalizing their emotions, but I feel like the 70s series understood that while still giving you things to root for in these very broken and very dysfunctional characters. Alec Guinness leading the charge with an incredibly powerful understated performance. He's just one of the greatest actors to have ever lived, and if you only intend on seeking out one of these versions, I highly recommend that that version be the series. So am I being too harsh on the film and maybe praising the series a bit too much? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, particularly if you really enjoyed the film. I wouldn't mind hearing from people who, who, who aren't necessarily movie critics that really got something out of the film, because I know that the film version was reviewed really well when it first came out, but um, yeah, what critics like and what audiences like tend to be kind of different, and for different reasons. So um, yeah, if you enjoyed the film, or if you didn't enjoy the film, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always below, you can find links to my various social media pages, including my Facebook and my Twitter and my Patreon page, so head over to that site if you would like to have a say in deciding what non-Bond movies I review on this channel. I do about like twice monthly polls on there, give patrons options of like which movies um, to potentially review or series in this case. Um, and obviously majority wins and the majority for, for this particular poll was obviously Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. So um, yeah, head over to that page if you want to have a say in that. And as always, please drop a like on this video if you've liked it. Please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And until next time, Spy fans, so long for now. Important public service announcement, this may well be the last video that Bieber Calvin appears. <laughs> so hairdressers are going to be reopening here in the UK soon, and not a moment too soon. I haven't been able to have a haircut since November. So that's just great, because I'm really getting sick of it. So until next, <laughs> until next lockdown, <laughs> this is Bieber Calvin signing off.